While Emma continues to do what she does best, which is eat and talk on the phone, we're going to take you back in time. We're working with the University of Oregon's Archives Departments to bring you some of the stories we did 20 years ago on KEZI. This is a ghost town series we put together. This is part two of Lost and Found Oregon Ghost Towns. Gold mines and ghost towns, the two just seemed to go together. When the word got out that the Blue Mountains in Eastern Oregon were full of gold pockets, it brought the miners. They brought their families and the business people followed. Together they built communities which now have become ghost towns. Tonight photographer Bill Getz and I are taking you to a place dreamers once called Golden Sumter. The scars of gold mining are scattered all over the Blue Mountains. This country was once filled with thousands of people. Now only a few call these rugged canyons and hillsides home. They settled near the Sumter Valley after gold was found in the mid-1800s. Millions of dollars worth of color was panned and scraped from these rivers and mountains. Just how many millions depends on who's telling the story. A few folks still mine up in this area, but for the most part, the gold era is dead. Locals say most of today's mining is done on the bar stools. These towns that once depended on gold for their livelihood are now cashing in on curiosity. Visitors will pay to pan for history. Jerry Meyer's family was one of the earliest to call this area home. Squeeze through. His kin never left. There was more than gold anchoring the Meyers to these parts. Fresh air, clean air, uh, atmosphere, people. Uh, I don't know, I'm just a mountain man, I guess. I, I've been here all my life. Sumter was the largest town. The railroad stopped here and so did 5,000 people in the early 1900s. When the mines petered out in about 1913, most of the miners moved on. Sumter began to fall. The finale was played out just after midnight, one hot August night that same year. Fire broke out in Sumter's business district. The dry and empty buildings offered no resistance, and within a few hours, the fire had burned most of the city's 12-block area and even consumed the wood-planked streets. Sumter was never rebuilt. Only the hospital and a couple of other buildings survived. And of course, the determined people still wouldn't give up. They knew there was still gold in the streams. So they built these monstrous dredges with huge iron buckets that sifted through the river rock, panning for gold. And they did okay for almost 40 years before the color faded. The rusting hulks of the old dredges remain where it ended. The dredging spoils are like tombstones covering the valley floor. Now 150 people live in Sumter. People are coming back. A lot of them are probably drawn by the same thing that kept the Myers family here all these years, the mountains and the good air. Not bad reasons at all. By 1900, several towns had incorporated near Sumter Valley. Born was built at the portholes of one of the area's largest gold mines. 1,500 dreamers crowded into this little canyon. Today you wonder where they put them all. Born was considered a rather rough mining town. Hotels, saloons, gambling houses, and stories that could keep the campfire going for hours. They called Born a hotbed, get-rich-quick gold town. But the mine couldn't supply enough gold to pay back the people who'd invested in it, and people packed up. In 1927, the Bourne Post Office stamped its last letter. Ten years later, a flood poured through this valley and almost wiped Bourne off the map. This little hillside, now called Granite, grew as a supply town for many of the mines tucked away in the hills above Sumter and Bourne. A few thousand people lived here in the early days. Now Granite is home to six. 
There are no phones, few crime problems, and two cars might qualify as traffic congestion. And that's what draws people like Tony Thompson, who runs the Granite General Store. Mm -hmm. no. To me, the rewards, looking out the front door and seeing the deer and the elk and uh, going down the road and watching all the animals, seeing the trees, the streams, the sunsets. Not a lot of people. An attractive picture, but even Tony will tell you it's not for everyone. I guess we're all uh, probably cranky, <laughs> rugged individuals. I don't know what you describe it as. I mean, everybody's up here because they chose to be. Rugged individualists, good description. Bonnie and Steve Skidgill certainly qualify. We do it because that's what just the two of us can, can handle anyway. The two burrow themselves inside this 600 foot long hole in the mountains to mine for gold. We just had to see what was in that hole so we just kept digging until we got it open. Why do you keep doing this? <laughs> I got gold fever. <laughs> A mine shaft is an eerie place to work for a living. It's cold, very dark. A haunting quiet fills the stagnant air. Bonnie and Steve find the mine comfortable. They say mining in 1990 is not that bad when you consider what the men who started chipping away at this hole had to go through. It'll do it. It can't happen when it's loaded. It's just, you know, going to be pretty heavy. <laughs> Did you know this much hanging will come down? No, I told you that. Well, I know, but this is all, like, quite a bit. I told you the big slab fell off. Okay. You guys can really see the... You can see the vein. Uh, the vein itself is looking pretty strong and showing pretty good values, so we'll keep going on it. The Skidgills are small scale, so aside from a drill, they mine pretty much the way the pioneers did. But remember, this hole was already here when they started. And that's what they you, mm -hmm. they used. That's yeah. what the old time was that. And the hammers. This hammer was in here. We put this it is in. a double jack hammer where one guy would hold the steel and the other one would drive. And it's pretty incredible when you think about these old timers doing this by hand. Mining is hard work and a lot of it to make it worthwhile. Locals say the less a miner brags about his or her gold, the better their strike. And the Skidgills say very little about how much pay is in this dirt. The people up here say life is easy nowadays. They will tell you they aren't as tough as the pioneers. We wonder. That was scary. And tomorrow night we're going to take you to a couple of ghost towns closer to home. Shanico looks like a backdrop for an old western movie. In fact, it has been used for a couple of movies a couple of times. And the other ghost town is quite familiar. You've probably heard it on this station many a time. We're going to take you on a trip to Rajneesh Ram.